Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Daniels faculty lecture, Shifting Ground with Marina Tabassum. My name is Sara Premji. I am a third year graduate student in the program, the Master of Architecture program at Daniels. It is my pleasure to moder moderate this lecture along with our host, who is a Daniels faculty professor and member of the Beat Toronto Advisory Board, Bridget Shim. She will also introduce our speaker, Marina Tabassum, and Daniels faculty professor, Mason White, who will lead the external events and read our no land acknowledgement. Let me turn it over to Mason. Thank you. Thank you, Sara and, and Bridget. Uh, Marina, looking forward to this. Um, first, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Daniels honors Indigenous peoples past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. Please note that this uh, is being live streamed and recorded. If you do not wish uh, to be captured, please turn off your video. We ask you to keep yourself muted throughout the presentation and you may add any questions in the chat for me and Sarah to relay to Marina. Or if you wish to ask your question directly, please put your name in the chat and note that you wish to ask your question on camera. And now I'll pass it to Bridget. Hi, uh, my name is Bridget Shim, and I'm a member of both the Daniels community as well as the BEAT Toronto and BEAT Canada community. Uh, <clears throat> BEAT stands for Building Equity in Architecture, and this event is one of several joint sponsorship events between the Daniels faculty and BEAT. It is my true great pleasure to introduce Marina Tabassum to you. I'm really grateful to Marina for taking the time to share her current work with us. This work includes recent projects that have been initiated since the start of the global pandemic, directly responding to urgent challenges in her own country of Bangladesh. What is remarkable about Marina's work is its intense examination of the cultural, social, physical conditions of realizing built form in her own backyard. What is so meaningful is that you can understand a place from the inside out. You can create design responses that fit the physical and cultural context, but through their specificity, they have a really important global reach and provide lessons to all of us. Marina Tabassum is the principal of MTA, Marina Tabassum Architects, founded in 2005 and based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. MTA seeks to establish a language of architecture that is contemporary and yet deeply rooted in place. Their built work includes community centers, public schools, museums, resorts, uh, sacred spaces, and the urgent global issue of housing. Marina graduated from the University of Bangladesh uh, 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 of Engineering and Technology in 1995, and she's amongst the early graduates of this school. And unlike a lot of other people, she chose to stay and work in her own country of birth and to make a difference there. <clears throat> in 2016, Marina received the Aga Khan Award uh, for a mosque in Dhaka, a really spectacular project. In 2004, she received the Architect of the Year Award from India for the NEK 10 project in Dhaka. She's also the recipient of many awards in Bangladesh, recognizing the contribution of women. She's also an academic advisor of the Bengal Institute of Architecture, Landscapes and Settlements. In 2017, she was the Aga Khan Design Critic um, at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And uh, she has also taught advanced studios as a visiting critic at the University of Texas and Brock University from 2005 to 2010. And Brock is located in Dhaka. Uh, and in a way, um, she has worked um, tirelessly uh, for community groups and has initiated the $2,000 home project in several villages in the Panagram region uh, of Bangladesh, which are currently under construction. <clears throat> 
I've served with Marina on the steering committee for the Aga Khan Architecture Award and have observed firsthand her commitment to giving back and ensuring that this important award remains relevant to the quality of life for citizens around the world. Uh, what is so wonderful is that Marina is truly an outstanding architect of our time who demonstrates so eloquently through her built work the power of architecture to reshape our future. Um, so please welcome Marina back to Toronto. She has been here before and welcoming her to uh, the first of many visits, I hope, to our Daniels faculty community. Uh, so take it away, Marina. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Bridget. It's absolutely a pleasure to, and thank you for this invitation. Um, it, I was, as Bridget mentioned, that I was there in 2019, I think, in a very, very cold January. And it was, um, it was, I think the school was closed at that time, so it was quite empty and there were not, not many students. Uh, but I, I had a tour and Bridget was very kind to show us around. It's a beautiful place and I really hope to be back again sometime soon, maybe in a better weather, <laughs> which is uh, better for my tropical uh, uh, person, I think. So I am sharing my screen. Um, uh, so let's see. Today, um, as I uh, was telling you about the fact that I have um, uh, made my talk or, or named my talk as Shifting Ground, and it, it does have a reason for that, um, which is quite unique to our Bengal Delta. Um, so um, oh, I think I, uh, what? so yeah. So if you look at this image here, uh, you see that it is a very dynamic movement. Um, it's an image, uh, a satellite image that was taken from NASA and it shows uh, two decades of movement of the confluence of three major rivers uh, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, and the Meghna. And uh, basically they're flashing on to the Bay of Bengal. And you can see how uh, dynamic the movement is. And this is what actually creates uh, this whole unique landscape of the Bengal Delta. And um, so basically that's why I call this uh, the shifting ground. Um, so this is actually the place where Bangladesh is located, where I am based. Um, I'm born and brought up also in the same location. It is uh, actually um, in the foothills of the Himalayas. That's where Bangladesh is located. Formed by this, two thirds of the land is actually formed by accumulation of silt and progradation of the Ganges estuary into the Bay of Bengal. So essentially, Bangladesh is made of water. So it's more of a waterscape than landscape. And if you look at the water uh, channels and tributaries, it is almost like a mesh or a labyrinth, as you see here in this image. And, uh, and that's how the entire landscape is formed. So quite often, we refer to it as a waterscape than landscape. Um, if you look here, in the sea level rise uh, is high along the Bay of Bengal uh, due to the change in ocean currents um, that causes a rapid surface warming in the Indian Ocean. And because of that reason, uh, it is expected that by 2050, um, there will be one meter rise uh, in the water level, which means that the salt water system is penetrating into this, into this uh, riverine system and that is really causing a lot of biodiversity not only that but it is also causing um, a lot of changes in human uh, livelihood so in a way it is time very much time for us to focus more on nature rather than on human and our human activities that has caused this imbalance into nature so restoration of the natural balance is key because there are a lot of people in this world especially if you go to the coastal areas of Bangladesh you'll see that um, 
they are far more natural as beings than we uh, who are living in the cities. So if you look closely um, how this dynamic movement works, this is how it looks. So it's basically during the summer months uh, when the Himalayan glaciers are melting. And at the same time, when we have the uh, monsoon season and there's enough, a lot of rain, um, this, this heavy water current in the rivers causes the, um, the banks to erode. And as the banks erode, it, it has taken away many villages and um, small towns and settlements. And if you see here, these are the stories of all kind of losses that you see. People have lost their homes, lands. Um, many people have become landless, have moved away. And with the climate change, as the sea level is rising, this is becoming far more uh, prominent and predominant a problem for the Bangladeshis. Um, on the other hand, yeah, there is another paradoxical issue, which is that new land gets formed, or I wouldn't put it land, that would be wrong. These are sand beds or accretions that comes up into the riverbeds. This is a very unique phenomenon of the Ganges Delta. And so uh, this would be wrong to call it land, as I was saying, because these are basically uh, a sand bed forming in the riverbed. And, and and I think I find Anuradha Mathur and Dilip Dakunha's take on this as to be the most appropriate, where they call it wetness rather than land. And in our local terms, we call these chores. So these chores are um, uh, an interesting phenomena in this whole uh, landscape. So why, why does this happen? That's something we need to understand. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background on the geoformation. And if you look in this to these images here, um, this map, which was from the British time, uh, 1776, which uh, shows the original, um, uh, it shows the original um, uh, flow of the river. And during the Assam earthquake in the 1950, the river actually changed its course and moved uh, more to the Jamuna River. And both together, this Jis and Jamuna together created this enormous flow, which then creates this, uh, idea, this act of erosion. And on the other hand, during the summer months, um, yeah, or, or during the dry season, when we have, um, uh, when the current becomes very quiet and low, uh, it, it again, because of the tidal, because it's a tide dominated delta, the, 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 uh, the entire system of water then goes back into this, it flows back into the system. And that's why uh, it's Eastern Asturian system. And for that reason, these new spreads or accretions are created. Um, so basically, uh, the entire area uh, of this coast, uh, coast is dotted with numerous stories of movement, movement uh, of generations, movement of uh, villages, uh, settlements, including bazaars, and everything is constantly moving. And uh, if you see that because of that reason, especially in these areas, um, this, new, this uh, vernacular architecture that developed was also something of about movement. So these are houses which can be the, uh, assembled and disassembled in a very short period of time. These are almost like a flat pack system, which actually uh, can be uh, put on a boat or a truck or a, or a ca cart and moved to from one location to another. So what happens is when people see there are cracks in the ground and they don't understand that That, uh, that the river take their houses down and move it to a safer location. So if you um, uh, go to uh, these areas, you find that there are shops where you can actually buy these houses and you can buy them um, or custom made them and you can take it. Uh, so it's all along this entire belt of the coastal belt and along the rivers where this erosion 
can happen. So you can find these. So when we were um, invited in the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, we bought three houses from the local market and we took them to Sharjah. Our idea was that if a house, which is a mobile uh, form, if, if it can move from one, one location to another, it can move from one country to another. So that was our idea. So for the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, we were asked to look into or investigate into the inheritance or what happens to inheritance in a movement or a moving um, landscape like this or a dynamic landscape such as this. So if you see this map here, this orange map that we have superimposed, this is a map that was uh, done during the British colonial time, which is from the 1800s. And these are known as the Moda map. And this map, if you place this map on the current Google image, this is what you'll get. So basically this area I'm sure, um, ha is not remaining the same. So the, what is documented as land uh, is not there anymore. The river has moved and shifted, but it is a, it's a kind of a unique paradoxical situation where um, during the British colonial time, uh, these chores, which are not really land, but actually accretions or, or sandbeds, were consolidated as land and registered as document, documented land in order for the East India Company to uh, earn a deal. So they uh, registered these as land. And uh, if you see this uh, far left the document, it shows that it it was leased out to the locals. Uh, so the locals took it as lease, lease, and then they were cultivating these areas. And in the middle document shows that when the British colonial empire left uh, the Indian subcontinent, they actually auctioned these uh, lands to the locals. So they bought them. And then uh, it was passed on from one generation to the next generation and it went on uh, and it goes on till date. And the problem is that the land is not fixed. It's constantly moving and it is not even a land. But this whole idea of, uh, of inheritance was brought into a place where there was none as such. So it was a sort of an idea of a dry culture where you demarcate land and then pass it on to generation to generation. Here, it was a, a, a very wet culture where there are much more accustomed to the way of the water and how it moves and whatever the offering the water well, water brings to them. And it was never owned by people. It was just um, enjoyed or celebrated. And so that's where it became a conflicting uh, issue. So, so uh, an idea of a dry culture was imposed on the wet culture. So that was our finding which we took to Sharjah. Um, and uh, this is a courtyard that was given to us in the triennial. And this is the venue, which is an abandoned school uh, from the 80s. And so they took it as, a, as the venue of the triennial and they gave us a courtyard to place our houses. So um, here you see on the left is the house in its own context. And uh, here uh, on the right, you see the house um, in the context of Sharjah. So basically, uh, three architects and a carpenter from my office went to Sharjah and they built these houses. Um, so it was, it's a really beautiful, unique form um, that if you, if you trace them, you see them starting from some, especially from the Brahmaputra, going down to the uh, coastal belts of uh, the uh, Bay of Bengal. And um, so this is the in interior of the house, one of the houses, uh, which is a two-story house. Uh, it has a stair that goes up. And here you see the city of Sharjah uh, behind uh, and, and in the courtyard is the, is the three houses. And they're very beautifully detailed and you see this nice crown on the head. And we found it's quite interesting um, as, uh, you know, th there are so many stories of loss and gain, but at the same time, it's not devoid of art. 
So this pandemic uh, last year, when we were sitting at home, uh, we were not having any work in the office, everything was kind of stopped. We decided to push this idea through uh, because as we were working uh, in our um, uh, in these coastal areas, we found a lot of people who were landless. And for that reason, uh, we thought that was there a possibility for us to offer them uh, maybe a small house or something that they can probably take along with them whenever they're moving. Because when people become landless, they just wait for these new accretions or sunbeds to come up where they can go and occupy. So we uh, created this um, uh, unique modular mobile home, we call it. So it's a space frame structure and um, uh, which, which has steel joints and bamboo and, um, and basically corrugated sheet roofing. Uh, so that, uh, and it costs about $200. So with $200, we can actually give someone uh, um, a house, which is uh, 20 uh, square meters of space. Uh, so this is, uh, this could be one of the situations as you see here. Um, so yeah, so uh, some of the renderings, this is our, one of our, uh, uh, prototypes that we built where there are two levels so on the upper level it's more for sleeping and the lower level could be a place where people can basically have their daily activities and and life so this is the upper level it has a kind of a, a ladder that goes up and uh, yeah so this is the prototype being visited by the british high commissioner and his wife um, so yeah, so it's, it's, and now at this moment, we are building 10 houses in the chores, uh, giving it to people who actually are landless and need houses. So what we are doing is we are taking grants from different people. $200 is not really a lot of money. So people are really donating and then we're taking that and people houses. So this can be a prototype, which can be used also in the cities, if you like, um, to house, um, maybe a small shop where the shop owner could use the upper level for sleeping and during the day they could use it more as a place to you know, uh, buy and sell things. Now moving on to more to the Western side, uh, this dark area you see is actually the, uh, the largest mangrove forest in the world, which is the Sundarbans. And this is where the Royal Bengal tigers are from. And so it's very close to this area, which is, you know, you can see the Bay of Bengal down there. It's almost like a painting. And very close to that is one of our sites, which is the Panigram Resort. And uh, this resort uh, was, a, was a project that came to us or to our office uh, in, in 2011 or so. Um, and the client basically had an idea that the Bangladeshi Delta is such a beautiful landscape but when you're in Dhaka, you have no idea. Dhaka is the capital of our country. When you're uh, in Dhaka, you have no idea that the, that the Bengal Delta is such a beautiful landscape. So their idea was to give people an authentic um, feel of what the landscape is all about. And from the very beginning, took this project as an environmentally and socially cost and responsible project. So if you see very closely. This is a, one of the rivers that is going uh, by the site. And this is our site here. And it's a very green agricultural landscape. The delta being uh, alluvial soil is fertile ground for culture. So there is a lot of crop and people are mostly farming and fishing. And so uh, around our site, there are many villages surrounding it. So if you have a look, this is the river and uh, at the end of the river is the site here and it is very green and vegetated uh, this is the paddy fields or rice fields um, and beautifully green um, and so when we went there uh, for the very first time as a site visit and um, i am you know, born and brought up in the city of Dhaka, and i do not have very much connection to the especially to the to the villages as we don't have a village home like many of Bangladeshis do because my family 
um, is is migrant migrant from the Indian part during the partition of the subcontinent. Our family moved from the Indian part to Bangladesh, so we never had a village home as such. So I grew up in the cities. So for when I went to the site for the very first time, for me it was I was really a foreigner in my own country. That's how I like to put it. And so when I was there, um, the first thing that hit me was you know my architecture background of the studies do not really equip me with the right kind of knowledge to build in a landscape like this, which is so very pristine and almost untouched a landscape. So how do I intervene into this landscape was the first dilemma for me. So, so this is what I, I have always written and, I've, and the very first thing that I thought of that it would probably be a crime uh, to invade this landscape with the roaring noise of architecture. So I decided that we need to learn from the land in order to give back to the land. So that became our mission for this project. So, so if you look at Delhi, this is a very flat land. There is no up and down, nothing as such. So it's very flat. So you need to create this contours which then gives you that small landscape. So the first act of building in this landscape is digging a pond. So when you dig a pond, you take the earth out and then you create a mound right next to it. So on the mound, you place your houses. So what happens is when it rains, because it's a tropical landscape, so when it rains, the water goes into the pond. So you collect the water, which you can then use later on. And, the, and your um, higher ground remains pretty much dry. So that has been the way people have been living in this landscape. And if you look at a household very closely in the villages, this is the program of a household. So there are rooms, uh, which are huts. Uh, there is a kitchen. There are rooms for all different domesticated animals. Um, there are granaries. There are uh, small... Um, temples. So all these things really is the program of a house. And if you take these uh, small elements and place them around a courtyard, and which is really not a defined courtyard, but loosely defined, and one courtyard is connected to the next courtyard. So it's, it creates a very um, social communal kind of an atmosphere where every household is one is connected with the other. Uh, and so that's how the entire village is formed. So all these small elements gathering an, uh, around a courtyard and then creating this entire village, which is um, a connectivity of open spaces. And the open spaces is where life is actually lived, not in the rooms, but on the outside in the courtyard. So the courtyard is actually the very soul of living in these villages. So that's one village, which is, uh, this was the potter's village. And uh, this is a weaver's village. So every uh, skill, uh, the villages are basically uh, defined by the people have. Uh, and, and so this is how the entire area is dotted. And so we became very close to the local villagers who are living there as we were documenting the entire process. We documented their houses, how they live, um, how they build the houses. And so when uh, we were first there, um, they, they thought that we will probably be building something like a city. Or, and so they were very excited. But then when we went and we were asking them about how they make mud, mud houses, uh, you know, they found that to be very peculiar because, you know, uh, for them, city is the progress, whereas we were kind of, they thought that we are sort of regressing into the past uh, by asking what mud houses are. Built. And this here, you see this image where the roof form, this is called the Bangla roof, which is very unique of Bengal Delta. Um, and it's, it's a kind of a, uh, as you see, it's a pitched roof, but it's a curved pitch roof. This was taken by the Mughals in the Mughal forts. And also uh, in our temples, we have the same kind of a form, uh, but built in a much more permanent material. And we thought, and this you cannot find anymore in the Bengal Delta because people are more going towards corrugated roofing. And so we thought that a resort could be a place where we can revive this form. 
So that was one of the ideas we had. So this is the site, as you see, the orange line marks the road axis and the blue lines are actually showing how we can come to the site by water. And that was one of our ways of bringing the visitors to the site through uh, boat rides. And, um, and there wouldn't be any vehicles within the site, so it would be much of a walking uh, uh, experience. So we created these meandering paths through the uh, trees, which is a very vegetated area. And the way we thought was as we uh, did our study on the village huts, we thought that we would create these huts um, and people would have the experience of living in a hut. So the material we went for is mud, mud uh, as a material, thick mud walls uh, as biomass in a way. And then uh, this uh, beautiful carved roofs, uh, which is very unique of Bengal, which is made out of bamboo and wood and uh, entirely mud and bamboo, that's our material. And you see that every household has a courtyard and the courtyards are linked with one with the other. So that's how we tried to create this meandering uh, experience of living or being there. And the other thing what we did is um, as we became very friendly with the villagers and the villagers didn't uh, value the idea of mud houses, we thought that it is important that you we bring back or try to bring back the pride of living in a mud house or living symbiotically with nature, which is absolutely the right thing to do perhaps uh, in the time uh, where we are living in. So if you see the, um, uh, the, uh, the younger generation, um, uh, especially in the villages, they are always looking towards the city. So they have the aspiration of going to the city and finding it. And we thought that we, sh we could do something where they could find job in their own areas, uh, probably you know, doing the craft or the skill that are being developed and, and to promote that through our resort and to, to in a way in reinstall the pride that has completely lost in many ways. So this is also one of the things we did. So we employed villagers, mostly all the villagers, uh, who were interested in working on the resort site so the so we could generate a local economy in a way and so we we, we uh, sourced all the materials from the location and also the uh, people who built the resort are also from the villages so this is what you see sun-dried mud bricks and mud mortar and yeah as you see here the villagers working with the bamboo strings this is the roof, as I was taught, this beautiful curved roof and uh, the this catching system, which is very unique. And uh, this is a weaving technique that the entire roof is woven uh, with this uh, thatch. And, and, and we don't find these people anymore who can or, or who has the knowledge of building with thatch. So we found two teams um, in the southern part of Bangladesh, close to the Sundarbans. So we brought them. And, and they did the project. We also have uh, women on the side because women do the best plaster. And that's, what, that's how the tradition goes that women do the plastering. So you see here. Um, so that's one of the huts and uh, some of the ladies who work on the site after the work, just, just chatting their time away. So yeah, so, so, the, so this is how we have built the entire uh, project and from the riverside this is what you see so the idea was that the architecture doesn't need to be you know crying out loud but it could be just very much blended with the surroundings uh, me as an architect is not necessarily present in in that sense but what we try to do in the buildings as architecture but we try to design the process and through the process we wanted to create a sense of ownership we tried to reinstall pride. We tried to bring back a certain ideas and form of vernacular, but were lost. So these are the issues that we tried to focus on. And, uh, and I think that you know, if it's not always necessary that we uh, go to a site and just, you know, just give it whatever we have as knowledge, but it's also important that we learn from the site and then to give back what is, perhaps more appropriate to that location without 
disturbing the balance of that place. So the details that you see are very much the villagers that are coming in and, and creating this uh, unique, uh, beautiful spaces. And these are such a beautiful material that, um, you know, it has that size. So to extend our relationship with the villagers, we convinced the client that we create something called the Panigram Community Initiative. And through the community initially started doing a few works, which are really not within our program, but then we extended our program and we convinced the client that, you know, it's a, it's a process of reciprocity where the are helping them and they need to also help the villagers. So in order to um, help the villagers, um, uh, we created the, a certain uh, different times where we did craft diversification workshops so skill-based villages, so they have different kinds of skills. So we try to diversify so that they can bring out products which they can actually then um, uh, give it to the, uh, the guests in the resort. They could buy them and create a small uh, economy uh, in that way. We created savings group with women uh, who started saving money uh, one dollar a week each person so there are groups of women who then uh, accumulated a good amount of fun for two three years now and, and they can loan themselves a certain amount of money to uh, making their houses better or you know create a better environment for them to live in um, in terms of hygiene in terms of um, spaces as well and also for other activities, whatever is necessary for their livelihood. Uh, so that really helped the savings group. And, uh, and this engagement, this community engagement uh, was very important and very uh, necessary for us. As, as you can see that, um, you know, we created this mapping uh, ideas where the villagers started mapping their villages. So the drawings that I showed you of the villages were actually mapped by the women of the villages. So these are some of the ideas we work. Um, here, as you see, um, is one of the projects which is very close to the site, about an hour's drive in Chinaida by Hasibul Kobir, an architect uh, who is uh, revolutionizing in a way uh, the way uh, the vernacular or the local people live. So these are $1,500 home projects where um, the way the entire process goes, it's a kind of a bottom-up process where uh, the whole idea is initiated with uh, first mapping uh, the villages or the places. And then uh, from there, um, they create aspirational model. And then from there, um, they create these beautiful houses, as you see here, two-story house with a bathroom costs about $1,500. And taking that idea, uh, in Panigram, we started these $2,000 houses. And um, when I was teaching at GSD, uh, my students uh, uh, in the option studio also worked on these houses, which, is, which would be budgeted as $2,000 houses. And in a village term, it is about 3,000 a goat. And uh, so my students uh, actually came to the site they visited the $1,500 houses to see what are possible within $1,500. Now they had $500 more. So what else they could offer? Um, so they tried to understand all the different kinds of materials that are available. So they um, did hands-on workshops, built certain things to be able to understand the material so that they could offer a better design. And the other thing, as I was mentioning, uh, that it's a bottom-up process where we call it a co-creation process, where the villagers and the architects come together and co-create. And the process of co-creation is about uh, the aspiration of the people who, for whom we are building, and also they have certain knowledge. And what we architects can offer is, the, is our knowledge of creating space giving better um, details, better design of the same amount of value or money that they could, uh, or they could afford. But within that small budget, we could offer them better ideas. 
So that's where it comes together. So this is how we created this idea of co-creation. And here you see the students um, interacting with the, one of the clients. And here they made a model. And later on, after the studio was over, we did an exhibition of all the different designs that the students did. Here's another group. You see um, one of the groups. This is one of the Bamboo Weavers family. This is a review uh, during the uh, final reviews. And here is, again, the exhibition. So here are some of the ideas that the students came up with. So this is one of the potter's houses. And you see that there is pottery um, uh, used uh, to bring in ventilation. Uh, this is another potter's house where uh, the student used the walls as shelving units so that they could store their, uh, their um, products and at the same time they could uh, create an interesting facade with that. This is one of the bamboo weavers houses. So this is a house of uh, two uh, women and, and, and their children because the, uh, uh, the husband passed away. And so for that reason, they needed a place where they could generate some income. So they created a tea stall for them within the budget of $2,000. And um, one of the architects of my office and an engineer actually painstakingly went through the entire uh, list of materials that they have used so that they could make sure that these are within $2,000. So, um, so the uh, uh, GSD made this into a book report. And so this is what it looks like. I think this is also available on the internet. So if you would like to go through it, you can perhaps. Uh, so in 2018, uh, at the Venice Biennale, we were invited by the curators, the Grafton architects, uh, Yvonne and uh, Shelley, and we were uh, given a spot in the Arsenale. And we decided to go with this idea of uh, the courtyard because the theme of that uh, biennial was free space. And we were quite fascinated by the idea that uh, free space is about going beyond the visual choreographing the daily life. And um, so we thought the courtyard of a Bengali hut is probably the absolute, the, the most appropriate space you can call a free space. And, uh, and I thought that, you know, beyond going that, we should also focus on the idea of wisdom, which I thought was my learning from working in this project, where now that we are so much, um, you know, flooded with information and data, at a time like this, knowledge is about, you know, experience. And while we, when we experience, we gain knowledge. And through knowledge over uh, a process of evolution, uh, this wisdom comes. And to, to sort of lose this wisdom uh, to all kinds of, uh, you know, troubles or the things that we live through would be such a loss. So for me, we thought that we need to focus on wisdom. So here at the Arsenale, we were given a site right there, as you see. And uh, so that's our site. And we wanted to create this courtyard, which is, uh, as you see here, um, in the plan. And what we did is we asked the villagers to give us different elements that are there in the courtyards. So like here, you see this is a granary made out of mud, and these are still used. Uh, so this lady, she gave, donated one of her, um, one of these granaries, and we took it to Venice. Um, and, and these are all different elements. And these are the people who were generous enough to donate these things. So we took it all to Venice and then created this uh, courtyard. And you see here that we, the, all the houses are in lines, uh, whereas this, these beautiful elements, which are actually uh, used in a daily life, even till date, are there um, you know, being placed uh, and to showcase that you can still live a life absolutely naturally, sourcing things from nature without really disrupting uh, the balance. 
So this is the wisdom of the land installation that we did in Venice. That's a, a grinder, as you see, this is the oven. So, and that's the boat, I think I showed in one of the images. That's the granary. Now going back to another project, which is again, I'm, I'm pretty much in the coast still. So this is on the Eastern side, that's the Bay of Bengal. And this is a project now under construction or we've just finished designing, going into construction. Uh, this is a site which is 2.5 kilometer away from the Bay of Bengal. And this area uh, was hit by a cyclone, very severe cyclone, uh, which is a category five hurricane uh, in April, 1991. And about 138,000 people lost their lives. And in this very site where we are building, uh, there was about 40,000 people uh, dead in one night. Uh, so it is, you know, cyclone, uh, this entire Bay of Bengal area is very cyclone prone. And almost every year we get one or two deadly cyclones. So the, since the vernacular architecture is very fragile, the government has created these cyclone shelters dotted all around these coastal areas where the cyclone prone areas. And so basically uh, when there is a signal of cyclone, people generally move to the shelters so that they can be safe until the cyclone is gone. So, uh, so one of our projects was to build a cyclone shelter. And in, during the normal days, this would be used for a certain work or activity. And during the cyclone, this would be entirely turned into a place where people can gather uh, to say, save themselves. So this, uh, for uh, our client for this project, uh, decided that they wanted to make it a mosque uh, because the mosque is basically a free space. And uh, with the mosque, they wanted to create a health hub so that people know that this is a place where they can come during cyclone. So it needs to be a constant movement. So health hub was necessary because there is not many hospitals around this area. So they wanted to create a health hub for primary health care. And, and so so this is what it is actually, a cyclone shelter, a mosque and a, and a health hub. And, and these are kind of really interesting images. This is a Mughal mosque in Dhaka and, and on the, and the base of the mosque is a place where people can actually stay. And this is the mosque that we can't build here in Dhaka. So in a way, uh, to some extent, I kind of tried to bring all of this together essentially and create this um, cyclone shelter and mosque. So there are these 12 volumes here. And um, the way the cyclone shelters are built, you cannot have any opening on the outside. It has to be solid so that the water as it comes, uh, the surge and the wind uh, is so enormously powerful that it does not uh, break the glass. So there is no opening on the facades, but these uh, structures are independent of each other so that uh, they don't need to they're not a homogeneous mass in, in that sense. And, and they have these channels where the wind can pass through. And the, in the lower level would be the health hub and in the upper level is the mosque. So that's where the people can actually gather together. And so there is an embankment surrounding it and the entire place is raised above the sea level uh, according to the government rules uh, so that the water surge cannot go above that. And, and so this is basically a two-story structure. And here the plan, you see that we have all these small uh, independent volumes and the lower level would be, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the health hub and the upper level would be the mosque. And the mosque is that space where people can gather. So this is now uh, going into construction. Um, and as you go inside, there would be these labyrinth of spaces, uh, which should be something interesting um, at the same time. So, so that's the mosque and the upper level. So Bangladesh, uh, the, the topic of cancer goes through Bangladesh, making it a very uh, subtropical climate, which means half of the year it is dry, half of the year it is wet. Uh, very uh, monsoon season is quite, um, uh, humid and, and it could be really hot. And during the 
well, so-called winter for us is really not much. It could be your spring in that sense. Um, and it is quite dry. So the temperature differences are very moderate. And as such, you do not need any kind of insulation or don't need to really pack your building that heavily. It could just be a pavilion. So essentially, an architecture in our subtropical climate would be just four columns and a roof to save you from the elements, uh, to shade you from the rain and the sun, and to raise you above the ground so that you don't get um, wet. So there is a plinth, four columns and a roof. Essentially, that is what architecture is all about. And here, this building is by uh, Mazar al-Islam, our first architect in, from 1952. This is a building from 1952, which actually um, is the first building in that sense, which uh, shows the, the modernity or the tropical modernity in that sense uh, in Bengal. And in many of our projects, we try to do this same idea of how you can open up the edges and create this connection between indoor and outdoor. So, so that you can blur the edge. So the blurring of the edges is very, uh, is something which is quite possible and also unique uh, because you need the air to flow. So the airflow is an absolute necessity for us to be able to live uh, or breathe in a, in, a, in a place like this. So in every building, when even it's a, if it is a high rise, like let's say here it's a 12 story build, uh, apartment building, even there, we try to open up the edges so that we can allow wind to flow in so that there is a constant flow of air. So uh, it, it is about breathing. So breathability of a building is very important for us. So this, this building, as you see here, it's on the Western side. So we try to block the West sun at the same time, um, creating a facade, which is in a way for the city. And, um, as I remember, as a young child uh, growing up uh, in Dhaka, we, in my grandmother's house, we had these long verandas. And the verandas actually work as a buffer between the outside and the inside. And it creates this, uh, and it gives us a cooler air to flow. And quite often, our lives were lived on the verandas and the rooms were where people would generally sleep. So, but the, nowadays, you don't see these verandas anymore. So in one of our projects, we tried to reintroduce this idea of a veranda that goes around or wraps around the building. So this is one of the projects that we are now working on. Um, so this has this long veranda that is kind of creating a, um, a wrapping around the building, which people can walk around, maybe even have plants in it. And then you have these shafts uh, of ventilation shafts that takes the air up and goes into the spaces. So that shaft is also quite an important element which really generates an airflow. So these are all passive means of uh, making a building uh, uh, more natural in a way. Uh, so this, this is something I've, I've been using a lot in, in most of my projects. This one here, as you see, um, it has this central atrium, which again works as that shaft which can really make the airflow upwards. So this is one of the buildings we designed for the French and German embassy. An embassy doesn't need to be uh, naturally ventilated, but even then we always try to keep an element where if, the, if anybody wants, can make the building work without uh, you know, the means of, uh, let's say, mechanical means. This is another project which is very close to Dhaka. Again, has that shaft in the middle, also works as a kind of a ventilation shaft. And much of our projects have these open spaces because we really like to um, enjoy the, the kind of uh, atmosphere that we have about the modest climate that we enjoy. So in terms of material, we only have brick. Uh, if you want to make something permanent, uh, because you can take earth and bake it, turn it into brick. And then this is one of the Buddhist monasteries. We have several of these Buddhist monasteries in Bangladesh. And as permanent structures, a brick has always been our material. Being a delta, we don't have any stone as such. So local material would be either brick or mud. 
And with brick or with mud, we have created this beautiful, intricate terracotta works that you see here in temples. Um, and so we also have really good brick masons as well, and, uh, and, and the finest of brick masons and really good quality brick. So this is our tradition. And quite often the construction system is about handmade. So everything is sort of handmade and imperfection in many ways is the quality of handmade architecture. And those who work with us um, uh, quite often become very close uh, relations in a way that they have worked with us for, for a long period of time, because this is all about skill when you're building with hand. So they're not really workers in that sense, they're much more like artisans. And, and so we try to, explore all the different kind of arts and artisans and skills that are there and, and try to use that in our uh, projects as much as possible. So I will, I have two more projects to show you. I'll go very fast. Probably I'm just overrunning my time. Yeah, so yeah. So this is Dhaka as you see in the middle here and the city is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Uh, it is, um, uh, the densest, one of the densest cities, 20 million people living in the city, uh, about 300 square kilometer of space. And Bangladesh has about 150 million people. And so within the city, it is a very dense city. And like many um, cities in, uh, in our uh, subcontinent, this has this formal and informal living side by side, as you see here. Um, on two sides of the lake. That's some of the images of Taka and you can see the amount of people. Um, and so one of our projects, which is the Museum of the Independence and the Monument of Independence, when we were commissioned this project through a competition, um, the, the challenge was that the, the, the brief wanted a museum and a monument in a park. And we thought that a museum means it's a building where they had a couple of different kinds of programs. And to place a museum within a park was about, you know, bringing building into a park. So that was something we thought would not be a right thing to do in the sense that in a city like Taka, we have very few green areas as it is such a dense city and there's too many built up areas. And this is one of the rarest uh, green areas that is left untouched. So this is the site, as you see here in the middle. And um, also the site has a history. This used to be a, during the British time, it was a horse racing ground. And as Bangladesh previously was East Pakistan after the British left. So during our Pakistan phase, this was a place where political gatherings would take place. And um, then Bangladesh, when we had a war between the Pakistan and East Pakistan and West Pakistan, that's a history of Bangladesh, birth of Bangladesh, where uh, we had a civil war uh, or let's say a guerrilla war in a way, we call it a freedom fight, a freedom fighting or movement where um, it was an intense nine month long war. And after that in 1971, and after that we won our freedom and became a sovereign nation so this, this is also the very ground where the first initiation happened about this uh, war and, and to become free as a nation. And also the same ground where after the war, there was this uh, surrender of the uh, Pakistan army that took place. So it's a very historically important ground. And so what we did was that, you know, to, to keep everything, um, uh, to, to retain this park-like atmosphere, we took the museum below grade. And we just create it a plaza. And as you see here, that's the plaza. Uh, it's a kind of, there are few elements on the plaza and it has a reflecting pool and an elliptical walkway surrounding it and a small amphitheater. And the rest of the park remains the same as people can just go around and walk as, as they would otherwise. So that's our museum. And that's the tower at the end, as you see. Uh, so what we did is we took the museum below grade uh, and we created a wall through which you can go down into the museum. And after you see the museum, you can come and actually uh, see the Tower of Light, which was designed uh, uh, to commemorate our freedom. So, so this project we won in 1997, 
And it took us about 16 years to finish this project. Uh, so in 2013, we were able to finish it with the tower. So I'll just go, uh, go very quickly through it. Um, so that's the museum, as you see. So you go down with the, through the ramp. Uh, this is a uh, audiovisual room. And this is the spaces uh, where the, uh, the entire collection, basically image-based museum. So it's basically images. Uh, as you see here. And um, so that's the museum part. And all the different uh, historical documents are imprinted on the glass. And you can just walk through it and have an idea. And there is this dark exhibit, exhibit area, we call it. This is where all the images of genocide and killings are, are imprinted. And then you enter into this circular chamber, which is uh, devoid of any kind of exhibits, but there is this oculus through which light comes in and a water column. This is a kind of a memorial to the people who has lost their lives uh, into the war. So that's a space very contemplative. Um, so in a kind of a spiritual space as well. And then you slowly go up uh, with the ramp again back to the plaza where you have the tower and the tower is actually made out of glass and glass stacked one on one top of the other, as you see here. So the stacked glass creates panels and then the panels are then uh, cladded onto a space frame structure. And what it does is it creates this refracted quality and gives this very prismatic uh, quality of light, which is then creates a glowing effect. So for us, the idea was a tower of light as, as commemorating our independence and freedom. Uh, so this is in the evening, as you see. I'll finish very quickly with the mosque project. So this blue dot you see here is the uh, location of the mosque, um, absolutely to the northern edge of the city of Dhaka. Um, and so, uh, so it is absolutely uh, the end of the city. And so these areas were agrarian areas, more farming areas, but over a very short time, as the city is growing very fast, these became settlements quite soon. So um, my grandmother, who was the client for this project, uh, you can see her here. Uh, so she uh, donated a piece of land that she owned in this area, and she uh, since there was no mosque in that location, she wanted me to design this mosque. And um, to, um, so this uh, image you see here under the jackfruit tree is a first prayer and the declaration that this land is being donated for the mosque. And, and you see my grandmother in white sari sitting there uh, in front of the haystack. And this was in 2006, September 2006. And in the same year in December, she passed away. And so I was, um, I had this promise that I made to my grandmother and I had to fulfill it. So for that reason, I became the client, the designer, the fundraiser, the builder, everything in one. So that's why this project is very close to my, uh, close to me personally. And so when I started this project, as I've never done a mosque before, and as the subcontinental uh, culture goes that women uh, were not uh, really encouraged to go to mosques uh, in earlier times. So I had very little idea about what a mosque is. So for me, it was something very fresh. Uh, so it was very easy for me to, to work on it with a very open mind. So what I did was I started questioning what is a mosque in 2006, especially after the 9-11 and all the wars uh, against Muslims and the and the, and the kind of an idea that was there at that time. So for me, it was very important to, I, to, to work on this idea that how do you identify your religion and how do you identify a mosque? Is it with symbols or is it about spirituality? Is it your connection with, the, uh, with God or is it about this identity of all the symbolic aspects that are there? So those are certain questions I brought into focus and also the Bengal legacy and all the other things that it's a space in trans transformation, let's say, and the budget was rather limited. So all these issues were important to me. And so if you look into the history of mosque, how mosque came into being, 
uh, in Quran, you will not find any prescription as such in, in terms of mosque, but it is supposed to be a space where um, as a connection with God, that is how it's created. It's a place where uh, during the prophet's time, it was basically a, a, a house form that was elongated uh, for the congregation to come and do their prayers. So basically, it was not just a space for um, praying, but also for all kinds of different activities like social, communal, uh, judicial, administrative. Uh, so this was a space where all kinds of activities took place, which you don't see that anymore. And as Islam grew from, uh, from the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula and went to East and West, it took many different forms, as you can see here. Uh, it took um, it adapted to the local material, local culture, the local craftsmanship uh, of building. So, so you see all different kinds of mosques around the world. And so basically there is no one single form as such. So in our Bengal Delta, these are the kind of first mosque forms that you see here, um, very authentic uh, Bengali first mosque. So that was also my starting point. Um, as how to create that connection. And in nowadays, this is what you see, uh, just stacks of floor. You cannot even tell which is a mosque anymore. Uh, so that's something uh, I thought uh, was not, not the right thing to do. But at the same time, you see what happens to the symbols here. Um, I mean, how do you know it's a mosque? So I questioned the symbols and I thought, you know, uh, for me, spirituality was perhaps the most important element when you go into a place of worship. And so uh, for me, these are some of the really unique spaces I really uh, felt uh, personally that uh, has that quality and it is all about light. So I tried to create that with light. So this is the site, as you see here, the site um, creates a 13 degree shift with the prayer hall because the prayer hall, the Muslims, pray in a certain direction, which is the direction of Mecca. So with that, I had to shift the entire prayer hall towards Mecca. And, and that was a 13 degree shift. To facilitate that shift, I started uh, to initiate, to create this drum-like structure so that one doesn't feel disoriented once they're inside. And also I can get rid of the corners that you see. And what it did was it gave me these corner, uh, these openings on the sides so I could bring in light. And that's also the shaft. I keep talking about the ventilation shaft that would allow ventilation to work. So coming from the older architecture to a much more contemporary way of designing. And as I mentioned that I had very limited budget, I sourced funds from all different places, including the locals and the community uh, who were very generously donating so what we did is we kept this main uh, prayer hall in concrete. We didn't want any column in the middle. So it was a column free span of 50 feet by 50 feet. And the rest of the uh, uh, space was built entirely in brick. So it's a load bearing structure wrapping around a concrete structure. These are some of the drawings. Um, uh, so you enter from the Southern side uh, and then you enter not into the mosque, but you take a few bends and then finally enter the ablution areas on the east side. And, and we tried to make it as breathable as possible. So we have these um, openings, as you see. So that's the mosque in its location. There are lots of construction going on around. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a constantly growing city. So the mosque at one point we won't be able to see anymore. So for me, the facades were not the most important elements in this project, but it was about the internalization. So we would like to look within than without. So that was the idea. So yeah, so you see the play of light uh, as we enter into the main space. So the, that's one of the uh, open courtyards, uh, the in, interior um, in a daylight situation. And the light constantly changes throughout the day as the sun moves. And even throughout the season, every season is quite different from the other. Um, so I thought that, you know, since we had very little limited budget, 
uh, the elements are very uh, basic in their form, but the light is actually the ornament of the space as such. So that's the prayer. And I will end my presentation here. Thank you and sorry for taking up too much of your time. Wow, thank you, Marina. That was amazing. I have never seen so many questions pop up in the comments before. Um, I think just uh, for the sake of time, we'll, I'll jump right into a couple questions and um, Mason and I will alternate from the chat. I want to start with um, this one about the homes in, in Sharjah, the mobile home address the question of landlessness and the lack of inheritance. These are really powerful when I think about the people of diaspora. So the ornament and detail when they, on, when they face so much loss, like you put it, is so striking. How do you imagine these pro projects changing over time, like 50 years, when dealing with weathering or disassembly, maintenance and deterioration? Um, well, they're constantly moving, right? So they, when they move, they take this, all of it with them. I think um, this element of uh, beauty or aspirational ideas of having a crown on the building is, is absolutely embedded in, I think it also reflects the resilience of people. Uh, so I think that's very important that uh, even though you are in a, in a situation which is very challenging climatically, ge ge geographically, which is not within your control in any way, and which can really get worse with time perhaps, but people are never without hope or aspiration. So that is quite unique. And I think in the Bengal Delta, that's what I find um, uh, is absolutely of a sense is the resilience of people. And, and so, and, and, and you know, this is a house form that has been there more than hundreds of, hundreds of years now. And till date, that's how they uh, choose to live. And that's what they carry on with them. So, so yeah, I mean, I, we have found houses which, has, which are like 60 years old, uh, moved from one family, one generation to the next generation. So there was a village doctor and his grandfather's house, which he inherited, um, has moved seven different locations uh, in the house's lifetime uh, of a 60 year house. I mean, the house is 60 years old. So, uh, and it still remains the same. And so this is about inheritance as well, that you hand down the house from one generation to the next generation. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, that's how it is. So I, I really, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you, Marina. Um, I love this uh, description of dry culture and wet culture you gave earlier. And, and there's quite a few questions I think about the prototype and, and maybe uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat as well for the book because I think I found a place mm -hmm. where it might be able to be purchased. Um, there's a question from Asiya Aslam about um, the how the prototype might be imagined as a standalone structure or as a community. And then there's a follow-up and related question from Hana Ali about um, the speed of assembly and skill level required and also the services. So I think there's, a, there's an interest in the audience today to hear more about the $2,000 uh, three cows and a dog house, uh, if you could. Yeah, <laughs> well, um, yeah, so th those houses are not mobile houses. So those are basically uh, in the mature delta. So that there are two kinds of deltas. One is matured, it doesn't move anymore. So that's where people generally build with mud. And mud houses are static. They are there for a longer period of time. And people in those areas are trying to move from mud houses to brick houses because that's more uh, economically status-wise, it's much more, a bit higher. So that's where we think that, you know, if it's an aspiration of people, you cannot really uh, case them in a mud house. They want to move ahead. So in that case, case what, our idea was that we have the knowledge of building with brick, which the villagers don't. They are much more knowledgeable about mud houses. So that's where we come in. We can give them the knowledge of building with brick and giving them a better uh, detail, better design, better space making, better construction technique. And 
and their aspiration comes in basically at that time. So, so that's how this entire process um, goes in terms of co-creation. And so what was the question? <laughs> I think there was just an interest to know more about whether they assemble, how you see them forming a community. I think this was the question right. from Asiya. And then yeah. Anna, I believe, was wondering just about speed of assembly and maybe some of the, on the technical side, there's a lot right. of interest. So I think when you talk about the speed of assembly, disassembly, it's probably the houses in the coastal areas where the active delta, so the active delta is moving. That's the one that constantly moves and that's where people are also moving. So um, uh, the, the co conventional vernacular houses takes about two days to uh, dismantle. Um, so basically they start dismantling it and then they take it to a safer location. And when they find a ground, they start rebuilding it. So the rebuilding can take about seven days. Whereas when we built this prototype for the landless people, these, they can make, move, they can assemble it in, uh, uh, it takes about three people to assemble it in three days because these are smaller structure and you can disassemble it within two hours. So that's how quickly you could do it. And, and the reason is, you know, um, we don't want it to be too large or too heavy a structure for people to move around. And basically these are bamboo uh, uh, column. I mean, the bamboos are basically the space frame uh, links. And what you need to take is only the steel I think we may have lost connection. Do you have that as well, Mason? I think we're just waiting to get her back. Sometimes it might have just drifted out. Um, it is quite late for Marina there. I believe it's uh, 12.15 in the morning. Um, oh, she's back. She's back. You're, you're still muted. You're still muted if you could unmute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think my internet connection broke. Yeah, sorry about that. So I was, I think I, I think, I don't know how much you heard, but I was just trying to say that, um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, we try to make it as light as possible so that people could move with it easily because they need to move a lot, actually. So if you could just take the steel joints and put it in a bag and you could just move somewhere else and, uh, and find some bamboos from there and then you can re-erect your house uh, easily. So that's what the idea was all about, yeah. Maybe Thank Sarah, you. do you wanna pick one more question from the chat? Yes, um, this last question, we can talk about sort of your, your um, ability to really collaborate and find insights from, from your engagement with the community. Um, one question was about if you find public funding um, with these and how you do that. And another was about um, co-creation, if that becomes like a series of, of conversations that become a lot like a client architect relationship. Do you have any advice on what works well and what has been successful for you? Right. Uh, so the first question is about the funding. Well, there are lots of different kind of fundings you can get, actually. So, uh, I mean, you just need to look out for foreign funds are available, local funds are available. Um, what we found, especially for the modular mobile house, since it's a $200 project, each house, it's much easier when you go to, it's almost like a crowdfunding. So it's easier to also go for crowdfunding as well. Uh, and that's what we are doing with these uh, modular houses because uh, it's easy, uh, small money. Uh, and you can, if you know that your $200 can actually give somebody a house or a shelter, it's much more rewarding. So that's how it works. Uh, for the other houses, $2,000 houses are mostly built by the locals themselves. So they save their own money. But at the same time, there are many uh, organizations who can who give grants. So they match the grant, like if, they, if the uh, locals have accumulated, let's say $100 of their own, uh, then the, um, the donor organizations give another $100, so that makes like $200, and then with that you could do something else. I'm just giving you small, in small terms, but, but there are many kind of grants that are available. And the other thing about, what was it, the co-creation process? Yeah, and any advice or insights you have? Right, that? yeah. 
So the thing is, the, the first important thing is, I mean, we have a bunch of community architects. They are really uh, very, uh, they know the tactic of going into the villages and how to work with them. Uh, what we found uh, through our work was that uh, the best way to uh, interact or get into a connection with villagers is through children. And so, because children are very easy and you know, receptive far more than uh, the elders, because the elders are always you know, a bit skeptic about getting into connection. So when you, um, what we did was we basically started talking to the children and then um, you know, having a certain kind of a dialogue. And then uh, we started collecting plastic bags from all different places and as sort of an incentive, we started making gardens with them. So they started doing gardening. And when the parents saw that the children are really enjoying and learning things from us, then they became more involved and interested. So that's how we entered into the villages and started working. So there are process. You need to figure out what process works where. Uh, and, and so, yeah, so in many ways, I think um, it's through experience that you learn how to do it. Yeah, there's no one single uh, <laughs> way of doing it. Thank you, Marina. Um, with that, I think that that will be the last question that we ask, I want to right. say that your work and your translation from insights, which seem to manifest from this like deep systematic analysis and representation, um, that translation to powerful built expression on modest budgets that fit the needs of the brief and the site, but the community and the people is truly inspiring. This was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, to see and register for our Daniels events this year, uh, you can head to the Daniels faculty website. Um, the next lecture series is held by Alfred Waugh. It's coming up tomorrow, Tuesday, March 2nd at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We hope you, to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Marina. And thanks, Bridget and Mason and the Daniels faculty. And beat Toronto. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.